Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Midlife Makeover Show. Today, we have an incredible guest who's here to share her deeply personal story of resilience and perseverance. Marsha Naomi Berger is a licensed clinical social worker with a thriving private psychotherapy practice in San Rafael. I know I didn't say that right. California. She's also the author of a powerful new book, The Bipolar Therapist, A Journey from Madness to Love and Meaning, where she opens up about her journey with mental illness, being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and the challenges she faced in her personal and professional life. In her book, Marsha takes us through her experiences of manic episodes and the conflict of navigating her relationships. Her story is one of tremendous courage, drive, and the support of the people who stood by her through it all. I'm so excited for this conversation and for you to hear more about her inspiring journey. Let's give a warm welcome to Marsha Naomi Berger. Woo! <laughs> welcome, Marsha. Thank you, Wendy. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. You know, I mean, just reading the intro, I'm inspired just because, I mean, first of all, I love a good comeback story. And I love that you're sharing your story. I mean, I can imagine that there's so many people that would go through, which I know we're going to learn more about what you went through and would never share that. And I think I find what's fascinating and sharing our stories is that we learn from each other and it gives us hope. Definitely. Yeah. So first question for you, I think your subtitle is from madness to love and meaning. Take us uh, back to what was the, the journey to the madness. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> that's a, that's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, well, I'm getting used to telling it since I wrote the book and I talked to people <laughs> about it. So it's not as loaded as it used yeah. to be, but it does still come back to me sometimes when I tell the story and, and, and when I write about my experiences. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with you that it is so important for us to share our stories because there's so much stigma around mental illness and mental illness is so common and people are very lonely when they have to feel like they have to hide it. Mm -hmm. uh, and my dream is for people to treat mental illness the same way that they would treat people mm -hmm. who have a physical illness with compassion, understanding and respect and no stigma whatsoever. Yes, exactly. And I'm hoping to do my little part in mm -hmm moving the world towards my vision. Yeah. So, yes. So um, my journey started, I could pick a lot of places where it started because there's a long continuum here, but I think the place it started, which I show in the bipolar therapist in, in vivid detail, is when I was living in San Francisco, I was a respected psychiatric social worker in an alcoholism treatment center. I was training other staff to do couple and family therapy and, and other kinds of therapy and also learning a lot myself there. Then I decided to go to my sister's wedding. She got married on very short notice. It was a small little ceremony. And uh, my sister was in New York. So I'm flying from San Francisco to New York, uh, the plane stops in Chicago and there's mm -hmm. time to walk around the airport. And I hadn't slept in a couple of nights for whatever reason, uh, probably a lot of excitement about something that was coming up and also something that happened a little before, which is also detailed in the book. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the signposts of man mania, you know, mania, or mm -hmm. bipolar illness when it's the high part is the lack of sleep. So, mm -hmm. but I wasn't thinking I had anything because I never had anything like that before. So I'm in Chicago while the plane is, is stopping there for a while. I'm walking around and I realize that I have these tremendous how powers to heal people. So I'm watching people as our paths cross and I'm doing my best to beam my healing energy towards them. 
because I really believed I had these special, special powers, uh, which is called a delusion in the psychiatric mm -hmm. world. Uh, and I was full into it. And somehow I made way, my way back on the plane in time, went to New York, stayed at my mother's house at, in Rockaway, Queens. It's the house I grew up in. And there I continued to not sleep and my mind was racing and I was becoming very high and also at some point irritable and mm -hmm. especially towards my mother who's no longer alive. So I'll say a blessed memory. Mm -hmm. And I ended up screaming at her just when it was time to go to the ceremony for my sister's wedding. I ran into the street and I was screaming and uh, the police were called and I was taken to a horrible, horrible hospital. Uh, it's called the Elmhurst. It was a, a, what, it's the epitome of a, of a snake put, snake pit, <laughs> snake pit. Uh, yeah. Everybody there practically, uh, who the patients were zonked out on a drug called Thorazine, which I don't think is used so much anymore. Mm -hmm. But it turned us into like walking zombies. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they kept making us drink this orange juice that was laced with Thorazine. Wow. And I, and I was there for eight days. It was it was just horrible. Uh, and it wasn't like they were being mean to us. They were just keeping us very, very sedated. <laughs> manageable. Yes, sedate, yes, yes. Uh, and fortunately, I got out of there. Uh, after eight days with help from my father and uncle, both of blessed memory. Mm -hmm. and, and they got me into a very good re rehab place. And I was there for a couple of weeks and they took me off the awful medicine. And I went back to California, back to my job. Uh, and then <laughs> there was I don't know how much you want me to keep talking. Oh about. yeah, please tell. Yeah, you know, I'm like keep going. Um, <laughs> anyway, I thought I was fine. I thought it was a big mistake. Um, a year, I was a year later. I was hospitalized again um, in San Francisco. Um, I was blaming my mother for my first hospitalization. I stayed estranged from her uh, mm -hmm. for a year. I wanted nothing to do with her. I held her responsible for me being in that snake pit, horrible hospital. And uh, and I, you know, I was back at work. I was doing my job fine. People looked at me a little funny, uh, but it got much worse after my second hospitalization a year later at Langley Porter and and then another hospitalization six months later. The reason I was hospitalized three times was that I wasn't yet on any useful medication. Mm -hmm. Um, the third time I got on the medication, by then I was a pariah at work. I was stigmatized. Uh, my coworkers were therapists and some paraprofessionals. And there's an expectation that therapists are going to be very understanding, <laughs> compassionate. Um, and I did have some very good friends at work, fortunately, uh, that were that way. A couple of women that I had lunch with just about every day, and they held me together. And I had friends outside also that were really, really important. And mm. uh, But at work, bad things were happening. I was, I was harassed sexually, I was stigmatized. Oh. I I was um ah. you were you I, really I, you really yeah. learn who your friends are, right? When you go through something like well, that. Well yeah and you also learn about people's own mental issues because mm -hmm. I figured later, much later, that why weren't these people compassionate to me who we would hope are compassionate to the patients that they and, and I, that we treated in the Alcoholism Treatment Center. And I think it was that, and this time, it was very, very common, especially in California and, and uh, the area where I live, the San Francisco Bay Area, it's very normal to be in therapy for your everyday neurotic kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. But I became psychotic, I crossed the line. Mm -hmm. And my theory is that that made people very nervous because if it could happen to somebody like yeah. me, what okay. did that say about what might happen to them? Mm -hmm. So the way some of them dealt with it was to distance or demean me or yeah. whatever it was to keep that mental illness separate from themselves. Mm. At what point were you diagnosed with bipolar disorder? 
Was that oh, before good the question. eight days? Or, yeah. Yeah. The first hospitalization, I left with no diagnosis and mm -hmm. some medicine that didn't agree with me, which um, I got off after a very short time. And, but I, you know, bipolar illness, which back then was called manic depression, is mm -hmm. uh, it's a time, it's a kind of uh, condition where there are very long periods where you're just fine. For some people, it's quick. But mm -hmm. for me, like it was a year and then I did again and then it was six months. At what point was I diagnosed was in my second hospitalization mm -hmm. at Langley Porter Neuropsychiatric Institute in San Francisco. And a psychologist there gave me an MMPI test, Minnesota Multiple Personality Inventory, I think that's what it stands for. And he told me it was very clear that I was back then, remember they call it manic depression but mm -hmm. it's now bipolar illness. Interesting. And I should start taking a drug called lithium right away or my career would be ruined. I still thought this was a fluke and that it was a big mistake and that I was just fine. I had been under some stress about a relationship with a man mm -hmm. uh, who I, that, <laughs> that's another story. Uh, but anyway, anyway. Uh, so, so I said, no, I'm not going to take it because I didn't believe him and I didn't like him. He didn't seem like warm and friendly. He seemed very clinical. Um, so I left AMA, that means against medical advice. And then I went back to my work and I mean, meanwhile, I was really doing fine at work. I, I published a paper that was, pre I presented at a national conference about alcoholism and family systems and how you work with families with the uh, person with a drinking issue. And uh, I was supervising people. And then I had my next manic episode, which landed me in, this was six months after Langley Porter. And I was in a different hospital in San Francisco. It was called St. Mary's. And uh, there I had a lot of support. I had hmm. a psychiatrist there I liked. I trusted him. And he encouraged me to go on lithium. And three dear women friends and the man who was my boyfriend at the time all talked to the psychiatrist. And, um, and he explained about lithium and they all begged me to go on lithium. Hmm. And I went on lithium. And, and how did that how did that change everything for you? Everything was fine on lithium. I continued in my career. I got recruited. Are you ready for this? I got recruited to work as a senior psychiatric social worker on a psychiatric ward at San Francisco General Hospital. So I am so curious how did how did this change how you practice? It was wonderful for how my practice. Mm -hmm. for how yeah. I practice. Yeah, because um, it gave me a lot of compassion for mm -hmm. the patients, especially the patients on the psych ward. And I knew by then how important it was for me to stay on lithium. Mm. On the psych ward, we called it, our, and I didn't tell, but this is another, another aspect of my story, is that I didn't know whether anybody at San Francisco General, whether any of my colleagues knew that I had a diagnosis and that I was taking medication because I thought maybe the word got out, but I didn't tell anybody. And I was treated really, really well. There was highly respected. I was based, based on my work training psychiatric residents, psychiatry residents. Mm -hmm. I was given a clinical faculty appointment at University of California Medical School in San Francisco. You know, so my career was just going along very nicely. Um, and how did this affect my work was in the hospital, patients would come, many of the patients, they get on medication, they go out, and then they get off medication, and then they come back. Mm. As we call it the revolving door. Uh, this was a reminder to me to stay on medication. Yeah. Stay on my lithium. And uh, the way it affected my work in terms of how I worked with the patients was because I never wanted to be in a hospital very long. I always wanted to get back to my life. Yes. So I was the very quick therapist for getting people diagnosed, treated, and out back to their life. Isn't that fascinating though? 
because of your own experience, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want you to stay over there. I want you to get back into life and enjoy life. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So gosh, that's a lot to unpack there. And how about now? Where are you at today with all of it? Well, it took a lot to write the book. Yeah. And sometimes when I, I, I'm working on another, another kind of, a, I don't know if it's going to be a book or a long essay. And so when I, when I write about it, 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 it does come back to a certain extent. Um, but I'm mostly fine with it. I mean, I feel like yeah. I have an important mission and, mm -hmm. and that counteracts the reliving the kind of shame that I went through a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I know for me, just, just, oh, I just got done. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was, when I was, it took me a long time to write the book. Okay. That mm -hmm. was, I tried writing it like about 18 years ago and I would start mm -hmm. and I'd write about almost everything except the mental illness because I just wasn't ready. Uh, and I wrote these other two books about relationships in the meantime, marriage mm -hmm. meetings for lasting love and marriage minded. The, the second one is for people that want to get married and want, want to date constructively or, or have, I have to say now, a lot of people say, I don't want to get married. I want to be in a committed relationship, which I'm not quite sure what it means, but I think my book will help them, <laughs> help them too. Uh, people, yes. you know, a lot of disillusionment with marriage because so much divorce, so many people like myself mm -hmm. um, grow up in, in homes where our parents were divorced or people have been divorced themselves. So I totally understand that people are reluctant to make that big commitment. Um, mm -hmm. But I did finally make it and, and I'm very, very glad. So, uh, so I, I know that it can work out really well if you get the knowledge uh, and you are motivated enough to make it succeed. Yeah. And how did, how did going through all of that change you and your relationships? In, in my relationship, you mean with mm -hmm. my husband? Mm -hmm. uh, well, he accepted me. <laughs> um, I didn't, I, I, in my book for single women that are interested in marriage, mm -hmm. I say, I write uh, about secrets. When do you reveal a secret mm -hmm. to somebody mm -hmm. that is on the verge or you think is on the verge of committing to you. Mm -hmm. And when I knew that was happening with a man I married, I took my advice and I didn't tell him until I knew that he was just about ready to propose. And I told him, um, I want to tell you something so you can think it over if you want to do that. And, um, and it turned out that he was fine, but he had known me for, you know, mm. he knew I was living a, a very <laughs> seemingly healthy life. That's so, uh, I, so that's unconditional love right there. It might not have been if, if he had seen Yeah, me exactly. Him. Yeah. So like the boyfriend that I had who came and visited me and, and was very supportive when I was at Macaulay or a psychiatric institute and urged me to take lithium. Um, when I talked with him about, you know, where's our relationship going? He said, well, let's see how the lithium works. Mm -hmm. and, and I, that hurt my feelings. But when I mentioned that to my husband, he said he might've had the same thought if he had known me back then. So oh. it's, it's understandable. Bipolar disorder, is it is it curable? Oh, that's another really good question because in the professional world and also in regular people world, mm -hmm. uh, there is an, a belief that it is not curable, that nobody recovers from it. It's That's not true. Mm -hmm. People do recover. My story is I don't like to spoil it for the readers, so pretend I haven't <laughs> said it now, but it is a story of recovery. I, I have mm. no symptoms and no medication and wow. have not for over 30 years. That's amazing. And so at what point did did you know that it was safe for you to go off the lithium? Oh, I didn't know it was safe. I was petrified to go off it. Mm. But I was um by then I was married and we were trying to get pregnant. <clears throat> and my psychiatrist, mm -hmm. my psychiatrist said that lithium can harm the fetus, 
So as an experiment, at least I should go off it for two weeks. And <laughs> even my husband come in, he was supposed to watch me and look for signs of. He was like, okay. wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was, I was really petrified because, you know, I'm, I'd worked in the hospital. I'd seen what happened to other patients. I'd seen what happened to me when I wasn't on medication. Um, but I did the two-week experiment, and and I was just like I always was, you know, with, with lithium or without it before I needed it. Uh, so, wow. so, um, so I never took it again. What What do you think triggered it to begin with? Is it something that I mean? Is it a trigger? Is it something? Is it something you're born yeah. with? Well, I guess it can't be something you're born with, right? If it's something that can I be, mean, there are different theories. There okay. Are different theories. Yeah. Um, I'm a social worker. Mm. As a social worker, I tend to give a lot of credence to what's in somebody's environment. Mm. Okay. Probably in the medical world there's more of a mentality of this is genetic mm -hmm. and it's it's a brain thing and something's off in the brain so we give medication to fix what's off in the brain i mean something definitely was off in my brain because mm -hmm. i needed i needed the medication for a long time however i think uh, in my case it could be that the brain just changed, you know, it grew mm -hmm. up somehow. But it also could be that my life circumstances changed in a way that changed my brain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that makes so, sense so, too. Like you you were even saying how like you hadn't slept and you were you had gone through something before that, which is in the book. Um, and so who knows, right? Like what can trigger and what can happen, but did you, I'm curious, did you have compassion and understanding to yourself during that whole time? Or were you hard on yourself? Like, come on, Marsha, get it together. Or were you like, you mean, okay. while, I, while I was having an episode? Yeah. While you were going through like in and out of the hospitals, like, did you, were you kind to yourself? Were you understanding to yourself or were you, were you frustrated with it? Were you mad at yourself? How did you feel just with your own personal well, the worst relationship. part of it was the shame that mm. from other people. Okay. Uh, and I think that is the worst part of mental illness. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's why I so much want to change that attitude or to do my little part in helping yeah. to change it so that there's no stigma, mm. uh, so that there's compassion, understanding and respect, just like there would be if somebody mm. had a physical illness. Right. Um, Just like if they had diabetes or a right. heart issue. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh oh, oh, I'm fine. Go, <laughs> go ahead. Okay. So we're saying that the worst part, the worst part is the shame. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want to do my yeah. part to get that stopped. <laughs> okay. what, what do you, so if someone out there is listening and, and they're struggling, with a mental illness, but maybe they haven't told anyone and yeah. they, they do feel the shame. What do you, what do you recommend? I recommend that they know that they do not deserve shame. And that mm -hmm. if somebody's shaming them, that is the problem of the shamer. It should not be their problem. Yes. People are uncomfortable. Many people are uncomfortable with mental illness mm -hmm. and they deal with it by the shaming or by distancing, them, distancing themselves mm -hmm. or worse harassment and it shouldn't happen and mm -hmm. it should not be the problem of the person who has the mental illness it should be looked yes. at as there's something off with these people who are doing that mm -hmm. yeah and, and, and then don't the other... let people define you that's my exactly message. do not let other people define you and you keep moving forward in your life because you like everybody mm -hmm. else have multifaceted aspects to yourself. Mm -hmm. We're all complex people. We all have strengths we can contribute to the world, mm -hmm. gifts, and we all have our areas where that might be considered weaker or less strong. Um, mm -hmm. So we want to play up our strengths. Yeah, and I think even just removing those labels that we will place on someone like 
uh, you know, whether it's a uh, bipolar disorder or depression, anxiety, panic attacks, whatever, that's not the person. And that's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, like my, my brother passed away of addiction a few years ago um, and so yeah. Good. And I can remember the first time he went into a coma from his addiction and I'll never forget this moment. Uh, and I, I remember walking across the threshold of his hospital room and seeing him in the bed, in the, the hospital bed, he's like six foot five, you know, all the machines wow. were going and and that was the first time that I, I mean, I always had compassion for him and empathy for what he went through for majority of his life. But it was that moment where I like really removed those labels of addiction and the alcoholism and the, and the drugs, all of that. It, they just, I saw him finally as a soul with a body, not a body with a soul, not a, a yeah. And it, it totally shifted my thinking with mm -hmm. how I felt about him. And I felt so, I just felt so bad for him, for what he struggled with pretty much his whole life. And so just like you were saying, it's like, we, sh we should be looking at these people, no matter who they are, with whatever labels that have been placed upon them, they are still a beautiful soul underneath that body. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, I, I really love that expression that we are souls with bodies. Yeah, yeah. I kind of think of it like a, a candy and a candy wrapper, but <laughs> it's just like we're just like a sweet little center, you know. But and the thing is too, like you never know what someone has dealt with in their life. That's true. Right. I mean, I'm sure you have, have plenty of experience with that with a lot of your patients. It's like what what they dealt with as children or teenagers or as adults. And there's a lot, you know, so it's like if someone's struggling with something, there could be a really good reason as to why they're struggling. I think there's always a reason. Yeah, exactly. Well, I love your comeback story. Thank you. Yeah. And you know what, too, I was just thinking, I think we talked a little bit about this before we hit record. It's like, I think there's like, also there's this impression is that like a therapist can't be going through anything in their life. Like they're supposed to be perfect and no, we're all works in progress. Right. And, mm -hmm. and because you went through all of that, it makes you an even better therapist because you have that empathy and that understanding. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I do. I do believe it. Um, yeah. I have my moments. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. Me too. Right. But, I know. Overall, overall. No, I do think it, it's tremendous help. And, and I, I was wondering after I, I had my book published uh, about my situation and my diagnosis and all, what impact that would have on my practice as a therapist. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I, I don't think it's, well, I mean, the people that I see, yeah. um, I nobody has said, oh, I'm so happy to know your story, but they're still seeing me or they started seeing me. There was yep. a very nice article before my book launch, nice article in, in our local newspaper and uh, about the book and my history. And uh, one of the women that I had seen years before mm -hmm. saw the article and so she remembered me and and she uh, decided to come start seeing me again with her husband uh, so she well did she be like well she must know something because look at you now right like <laughs> even after going through all of that you must know something yes. well, yeah and, and she was <laughs> impressed that when, when I saw her the first time way back I didn't remember telling her this. I didn't even remember her, um, but because we see a lot of people, uh, but but she remembered me and she remembered that I told her that she did not need therapy. She should talk to her friends. And I don't tell many people that, but I, I, I yeah. told her that. And, and, uh, but now she was in a situation where she, she and her husband are using therapy very well. Wow. Yeah. And, and I have another, another client who um, somehow he found out Oh, I know. I know. He he um, he got my book, Marriage Meetings for Lasting Love. Mm -hmm. And I was seeing him with his wife and he said, 
Oh, this was before I got the book. He said, oh, you wrote a book. And I said, I wrote three books. And he said, oh, what were they? And I thought, oh, no, now I have to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him. And, and But, you know, I don't think it made a bit of difference. If anything, mm -hmm. maybe it helped because here's a guy who's been in um, a recovering alcoholic, like got his 25-year uh, chip or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. they give him something. Uh, sober so uh, so I had my thing and he had his thing and, yeah you know, we all like, have our thing right yeah, like, yeah. so so I I you know I, there's no way to know who's not calling me for therapy <laughs> because of that but uh but everything seems to be okay as far as I know and and maybe because it happened such a long time ago um when I tell people about yeah. my book <laughs> stuff they uh, Heart, nobody seems to um, hold it against me. And I had been afraid that I was going to get re-stigmatized and maybe I am and they're not telling me, but I'm really, really strive to have it not be my problem if that's what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you told your story. That's got to feel so good though. I can't imagine like when you were holding that book for the first time, that's, it's got to be pretty rewarding. <laughs> well, tell us how we can find you. Oh, okay. Uh, you can find me on my website, which is the easy way to remember it is marriage meetings with an S dot com. Oh, it's also yeah. Marcia Naomi Berger dot com, but marriage meetings dot com works. And I'm on you can get and all book. of your, your all of your books are are they on Amazon? They're all on, on the usual, <laughs> all those places, album. um, support your local bookstores by buying it on bookshop.org, or you can ask oh. for it at your local bookstore. Oh, nice. Thank you so much, Marsha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wendy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone have a great day.